Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Close the semester. No. Um, yeah, so we have about an hour and 56 slides. And since so I don't want anyone to miss any of their cookie time, please don't ask any questions. Uh, <laughs> No, I have, uh, we'll see how it goes. We might skip a uh, couple of sections. OK, so this talk is going to be based on a pretty long series of papers from the last um, three years, most of which were done in the Hebrew University with my group there. That's Amnon Shah Shua, um, doctoral students Sol Shahir and Yoav Levin, master's students Onen Tamari and David Yakira. These are the works on expressiveness. And the last work that I will cover on optimization that was done here with Sanjeev and Elad. Okay, um, so what we're going to do is start with a perspective, personal perspective, which at least some of the people here have already heard in one way or another. Uh, so it's a perspective of mine on deep learning theory, and in particular on expressiveness optimization generalization. And then after about hopefully 10 minutes of babbling, I'll start talking about uh, my actual works. Um, talk about an equivalence between convolutional networks and hierarchical tensor decompositions, and then talk about expressiveness and optimization. OK, so at the end of the day, deep learning, at least from my perspective, is a particular class of machine learning, statistical learning models. And if we want to formalize questions in the area of deep learning theory, we have to start with statistical learning. And what I'll present here is the fundamental, that's the basic statistical learning setup. So we have an instance space X. Okay, this is the space of objects that we want to say something about. For example, images. Okay, so X could be 100 by 100 matrices in the case where we want to infer something about 100 by 100 grayscale images, okay? 10,000 pixels. Why this is the label space, okay? The set of possible labels that we can assign to a particular instance, okay? So for example, if we want to classify images to dog or cat, then Y could be zero or one, or we could classify into more than two categories. It could be a fi any finite no um, set. It could also be continuous if we want to measure some continuous property of the image or the object that we care about. There is some distribution over labeled instances. Okay, some distribution over image label pairs. We don't know this distribution, but we assume that it exists. And there is some loss function. Okay? This is a function that intakes two labels and outputs a non-negative number that says to what extent they deviate from one another, okay? how much different they are. So if the labels are continuous, a reasonable measure would be just a square difference. Okay? The fundamental statistical learning task is the following. We are given a training sample, training set. These are M labeled instances, M pairs, image label. And they are drawn IID from the distribution D. That is the assumption. Okay? We don't know D, but we have access to this finite sample drawn IID from D. And given this training set, our objective is to return a hypothesis, that's the name, Another alternative name is predictor. That's just a function from instances to labels. And we would like to return a function that minimizes the population loss. What is the population loss? That is the average error over the world's distribution, over the distribution D. It's the expectation of the loss, the discrepancy between the true label and our prediction. Okay? That's what we want to do. The basic statistical learning approach is the following. It's very, very simple. We predetermine a set of functions from instances to labels. It's called a hypothesis space. Okay? We predetermine that. We fix that before seeing the training set. Given the training set, we return the member of this space, the hypotheses, that minimizes the empirical loss. Okay? This is not the population loss. Population loss is something that we can't measure because we don't know D. The empirical loss is exactly the same. It's the average loss, but now over the training set. It's just the average loss over all the pairs that we are given. Okay? That's the basic statistical learning approach. And there are three fundamental factors that determine the quality of the hypothesis that we return. 
Okay, this is kind of a illustration. So in gray here, this is the set of all functions from instances to labels. Okay? In blue, that's our hypothesis space. We fixed that in advance. There is some distribution D to the world. We don't know it. There exists some function that is optimal, that minimizes the population loss. Okay? We can't find it because we don't know D, but it exists somewhere out there. Okay? And it has nothing to do with our hypothesis space. In our hypothesis space, there is some hypothesis that is optimal, that minimizes the population loss. This is also something that we can't find because we don't know D, but it's somewhere in our hypothesis space. Something we can find, if you put computational issues aside, is the hypothesis that's optimal on our training set. Okay, this is the one that minimizes the empirical loss. In H bar, that's what we ultimately return. And there are three sources of error. We'll go through them now one by one. The first is approximation error. Okay, this is also called expressiveness. Um, this results from the fact that our hypothesis space does not necessarily, is not necessarily able to reach the minimal population loss. Okay? The more functions our hypothesis space contains, the smaller this error term is going to be. Okay? And this has nothing to do with our training set, has nothing to do with statistics. The second source of error is called estimation error. And this results from the fact, ultimately, that our training set is finite. Okay? If it were infinite, then probably a hypothesis that does a good job on the training set would do a good job in the real world. But it's not infinite, it's finite. And there is some error here that intuitively reduces if we have more training samples. But this is the source of error. It's called generalization, by the way. That's the difference between empirical loss and population loss. And the last source of error results from the fact that it's not always easy to find this H star S. It's not always easy to minimize the empirical loss numerically, computationally. Sometimes we can't really do it. We only find an approximate solution, H bar. So this is called the training error, right? also known as optimization. And what we're going to do now in five minutes is reflect on the state of our understanding, how these three factors come into play in classical machine learning versus in deep learning, okay? which is the kind of machine learning that um, by far is most successful today and which we don't understand very well. OK, so in classical machine learning, I guess the, at least the way I see it, the fundamental principle in models like SVM, which were kind of the bread and butter in classical machine learning, is that we only What's work SDM? SVM, SVM, support vector machines. That's okay. When I say classical machine learning, you can think of that. Okay? It doesn't really matter what it is. It's just linear classifiers with a specific loss. Thing is that in classical machine learning, problems are framed in a way that the empirical loss minimization, the search of H star S, is something that we can do efficiently. It boils down to an optimization of some convex function. And that's something that we know how to do. And so, in this case, we pretty much are able to find H star S, and the training error is pretty much zero. Okay? And in terms of expressiveness and generalization, we have something very well known, has many names, goes back, dates back long before machine learning was called machine learning. It's called the bias variance trade-off. And intuitively, it means the following. If I take my hypothesis space and expand it, make it larger, okay, then the approximation error is obviously going to reduce. Um, the estimation error, however, is going to increase. It will be harder to find. It will be harder for the, it, we will need more examples. Let's put it this way, OK? In order for our empirical loss to reflect the population loss, more examples are going to be needed if our hypothesis space is larger. Okay? And the vice versa, if h is smaller, approximation error increases, estimation error decreases. Okay? And I think it's safe to say, at least up until about five years ago, we felt that um, we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. Okay? And unfortunately, about five years ago, things, a different approach began working so well that people just well, had to. It's unfortunately for theoreticians, because now they have to analyze something that they don't understand. It's much easier. It's Sorry? It's also fortunate. Yeah, I'm kidding. Depends on, it depends on for whom. Yeah. 
but at this point. <laughs> okay, so um, what's going on in deep learning? First of all, the empirical loss minimization is no longer a convex program. Okay? It's non-convex. We relieve ourselves from the restriction of working only with settings that will give us a convex program. And in this case, H star S, the, the hypothesis that minimizes the empirical loss, is not unique. Okay? There are many of them. And for some reason that we don't really understand, gradient-based method, methods like stochastic gradient descent, which you can think of as gradient descent, for those that don't know, uh, somehow it reaches one of these low empirical error hypotheses. It's not something that we understand. And in terms of um, expressiveness and generalization, the situation is even more, um, I guess, uh, surprising. Now, there are many hypotheses with low training error, and we know that some of them have low population loss and some have high population loss. Some generalize well, others don't. We don't really understand which is which. What we do know is that on the kind of problems that we typically apply deep learning to, SGD usually finds hypotheses that do generalize well. And it's something that we don't understand. And perhaps even maybe most surprisingly is the fact that seemingly there is no bias variance trade-off. If I expand my hypothesis space, obviously the approximation error decreases, but it seems that the estimation error decreases too. Larger models generalize better. Seems like the more expressive models are, the better they ultimately work. And this is something that we don't uh, understand. Okay, so that was kind of the bottom line, not well understood. Okay, so that was kind of the introductory part that um, hand wavy I tried to convey. Yeah. Is there any understanding of what space is y? To, when you say with typical data, that means there's some choice of y to the x that's not arbitrary. There's some choice of h. Well, so these are all functions in gray. This is what we work with. Deep learning. So it refers to various things, but first and foremost, a specific type of hypothesis spaces okay, that would lead to non-convex programs. So yes. But then you say there are uh, problems that you actually apply this to. Yeah. And that means you're, there's a choice of x and y. Yeah. So x and y, that's not the difference between now and then. That, for example, is images to dogs or cats. Right. Okay. The difference is in the type of functions. All right. So now, without further ado, I'll start talking about uh, my actual works. Okay. We're going to start with an equivalence between convolutional networks and hierarchical tensor decompositions. Okay. So convolutional networks, how many people here have heard of this? Okay, so these are kind of the, that's the, I guess, the main type of deep learning architecture. Deep learning would not be what it is without convolutional networks. Okay, this is what spurred its resurgence. This is what underlies all of the image processing applications that you encounter as consumers okay, on your phone, when your face is identified in Facebook, or data is uh, drawn from images and sent to some uh, unknown organizations. It's all thanks to convolutional networks. We should all be grateful. And um, nowadays, they're also used for audio and text. This is the main deep learning architecture. Okay? So we'll go through the basic structure, because this is important. Okay? So we'll go through this in detail. So we have an input image, for example, 256 by 256. We then have small filters sliding across the image. Okay, it's a convolutional operation, and we get a heat map. We have multiple filters, so we get multiple feature maps. Okay? Sometimes, or, or typically, there is some pointwise nonlinearity then that is applied to these feature maps. And then there is a spatial decimation. Okay? Each channel, each feature map is decimated, for example, by taking small windows and taking the maximum from each window. And okay? that's called a pooling layer. So we have convolution, pooling, Together, they form a hidden layer. Then that continues. We have another convolution. 
by various filters sliding across this block now, creating multiple heat maps, multiple feature maps, then again decimation, convolution, decimation, multiple hidden layers, until all the spatial dimensions collapse, and then we have a final linear layer at the end. Right? That's the basic convolutional network structure. It is called Lenet, um, in virtue, kind of Jan Le Kuhn, which developed these things over about two decades, I think. And that's the basic content. That is what kind of caused a deep learning explosion in 2012. Since then, there are various types of other variants. Um, we might touch upon some of them. Okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, you start with a picture. When you got your Lynette at the end there, you got just a string of numbers that uh, is what you're carrying as the information from the picture. Right? So if I'm interested in um, predicting some scalar, some could, if my label is a scalar, I would have one output. Typically, if my label is a finite number of categories when I want to classify, so I have k categories, for example, I would have k outputs. Classification is according to the maximizer. OK? Yeah? I didn't understand what the convolution layer was doing. What, so what was it? So uh, are you familiar with convolution as a general concept? OK, so. In harmonic analysis, yes. <laughs> OK. So um, if I have a vector, I have a small vector, Okay, I can slide a filter across a large vector. At every location, I take the filter, match it across the indices in the vector that are aligned to it, and compute the inner product. Okay, so I compute inner products and slide my filter, each time computing the inner product against the respective location, and I get a series of numbers. That's convolution in 1D. Here it's in 2D, so I have 2D filter slided across the image, at every location, I take the inner product between the pixels that are beneath the filter, I get a number. So you're taking the inner product with a sort of vector, or which is mostly zero entry. Is that you can think about it that way. And I, but I, it's the same filter sliding across mm -hmm. the yeah. And they overlap these, these, these Yeah, typically, overlap. typically they do. OK, and then there's a pooling. That's kind of decimation. OK. And how many layers does it not use? So that's um, called the depth of the network. In the, I guess in the past, when deep learning didn't really work, because a lot of these ideas are very old, it would have two or three layers. Um, modern deep learning is at least eight or something like that. These days, it could be hundreds, even thousands. Now, there, there are sort of two dimensions. You have another, you have a dimension the, uh, this way, and then a dimension in, yeah. in, into, the, in, into the screen. Yeah. So which one is? Which one is called depth? Or? Depth is the number of layers. Convolution oh. plus pooling, that's a layer. Okay. This is a width, if you kind of inside oh, the slide. That's called the width of a layer, of a particular layer. Okay? okay? Where's the nonlinearity? So the nonlinearity is in, could be in two places. One, after the convolution, I could apply a pointwise nonlinearity. Is uh, kind of truncation kind of thing? For example, cutting off uh, negatives. That's something very popular. And also in the decimation, there could be nonlinearities. So sometimes it's average, but usually it's max. Okay, summarize two by two windows by taking the maximum, that's nonlinear. Max. Max, yeah. So why have you got lots of sheets in the second place you convolved? Here? Because I convolved with multiple filters. Each one of them gave me a different uh, sheet, if you will. Okay? And these filters are what is learned. These are the, the let's put it this way. This structure is a hypothesis set, a hypothesis space. And every choice of filters give, you a different, give me a different hypothesis, a different member of that set. Okay, so learning refers to choosing a hypothesis within my space, and that is exactly choosing the values of all the filters across the network. So a filter might be looking, say, for a vertical line segment or something like that? A filter might be, I'm sorry? Looking for a vertical line segment? It's called features, for these example. things, what exactly, yeah, but I, th that's not the viewpoint that I'm going to uh, kind of adopt through the talk, but yeah. Some people think about it that way. Okay, so. These things um, were invented through trial and error and intuition, somehow ideas from the brain. Um, but they were not kind of derived mathematically. What we're going to do now, in retrospect, is build from the ground up a hypothesis space. And we'll see that convolutional networks emerge pretty naturally. OK? All right, so we want to realize functions over many local elements. Let's think of them as pixels. Okay? So we want to realize functions over many pixels. We will call our pixel space RS. Okay, so if we're interested in RGB pixels, then S would be 3. Okay, if it's grayscale, S would be 1. 
and consider the square integrable functions over pixels, okay, L2RS, and functions over n-tuples of pixels. That would be an image. Okay? This is functions over pixels, functions over images. It is well known that functions over images, the space of functions over images, is a tensor product of the space of functions over pixels with itself n times. Okay? For those that are familiar with this, um, probably understand. And for those that don't, it doesn't really matter. The implication, what's important for us, is the following. If I have a set of functions, okay, some kind of basis that spans functions of interest over pixels, I can create from that a basis for functions over images. How do I do that? It's very, very simple. I have FD here. These are functions over pixels. And given an image, given an n-tuple, I take one function, one basis element, apply it to the first pixel. Take another one, maybe different, maybe the same, apply it to the second pixel. Another one, apply it to the third, and so forth. And then I take the product of all of these, and I get myself a single function from images, from n-tuples of pixels, to the reals. All possible choices, this would give me a basis for the space of functions over images. OK? All right. So for practical purposes, um, working with infinite bases is not something that we can do. We are going to assume now that we can restrict the space of functions over pixels to a finite dimensional subspace. Okay? We're going to assume that functions over pixels, it's enough to have some finite set of functions, maybe 100 or 200, and that would span all the functions of interest over pixels. Okay? That's the only kind of... I guess, assumption that we're going to make. Right? And these functions are called descriptors. Okay? So there are a lot of statistical works on images that support this uh, assumption, but let's put that aside. Treat it just as an assumption. And given this assumption, functions over images can now be written like this. What do we have here? These are product functions, that product basis that we saw before. Okay? And there are m the number of functions over pixels, to the power of n, the number of elements, the number of pixels, m to the power of n possibilities. And we just have a linear combination of those. Okay? And the coefficients can naturally be thought of as a tensor. Okay? This is a coefficient, and it has n number of pixels indices, each one going between 1 and m. Okay? So it's a coefficient tensor. Let's think of an example, because this is a little confusing. If we are interested in realizing functions over 100 by 100 images, okay, so n, number of pixels, is now equal to 10,000. Okay? And suppose we represent this something common, pixels with 100, 200, in this case 256 descriptors. Okay? In this case, coefficient tensors have 10,000 dimensions, and in each dimension the length is 256. So now we've identified functions over images with coefficient tensors. All right? OK. So these coefficient tensors, their size is exponential. It's exponential number of pixels. It's huge. It's not something that we can do anything directly with. The basic observation we make is the following. And this is important. This is going to underlie all of the results that I'll show on expressiveness. Okay? The observation is as follows. If I take this coefficient tensor and apply a hierarchical decomposition to it, we'll give a few examples of what that means for those that don't know. If I take that coefficient tensor and apply a hierarchical decomposition to it, okay, I get a function that is realized by a convolutional network. So it's a specific type of convolutional network. It doesn't have these nonlinearities, rectified nonlinearities, or something like that. The nonlinearity only comes from the decimation, the pooling, and the pooling implements a product. Okay, so this type of convolutional network is called convolutional arithmetic circuit. I will talk later about convolutional networks that are kind of the most popular type. For now, what you need to know is that this type of convolutional network is called, they are called convolutional arithmetic circuits. So we plugged in a tensor decomposition to the coefficient tensor. We got a convolutional network that computes the function. Okay? And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the type of decomposition we used 
and the architecture of the network that we got. So if I applied a decomposition of a certain type, I would get a specific type of network. If I change something in the decomposition, for example, add a level to it, whatever that means, I'll give examples, that would mean adding a layer to the convolutional network. Okay? If I change some internal rank in the decomposition, that changes the width of a, of a hidden layer in the content. Okay? And under this mapping, the parameters of the decomposition are exactly correspond to the weights, the learned filters of the network. Okay? So instead of thinking about convolutional networks, we could just think of the corresponding hierarchical tensor decompositions. Okay? This is a little abstract. Let's now give a couple of examples. So the network weights were not unique because there are lots of solutions. So similarly, the decomposition parameters are not? Yes. Yeah. And we'll see it. I guess if you kind of think about it for two seconds, you can actually see it here. Example number one, CP decomposition. That's the most basic tensor decomposition. Okay? It's a straightforward generalization of low rank matrix decomposition. If I have a million by million matrix, I can represent it as a sum of outer products between a million dimensional column vector and a million dimensional row vector. Okay? It's just the linear combination of those gives me a low rank matrix decomposition. In the case of tensors, I don't take an outer product between two vectors, I take an outer product between many vectors. N, number of pixels. Okay? For every pixel, I have a vector here. Take their outer product, I get an order N tensor, and I take a linear combination of those. That's CP decomposition. Okay? If I plug this in to the coefficient tensor, I get a function that is computed by a shallow convolutional network. Okay? This network has a single hidden layer with convolution, spatial dimensions here are one by one, and then global pooling and a final linear layer at the end. The width of this hidden layer is exactly the number of terms in the decomposition. These vectors are exactly the convolutional weights, and these coefficients are exactly the linear weights at the output. These two things are the same. Okay. A more interesting example is as follows. Yeah, so that's excellent question. Next slide. That's kind of a synonym. Excellent question and next slide. Okay, so indeed, deep learning is only interesting when it is deep. And as opposed to CPD composition, which goes back, nobody can even trace to when, hierarchical Tucker decomposition is much, much newer, was only introduced in 2009. And I won't go through all the details, I'll just convey the intuition behind this decomposition. What happened in the case of CP? We took a bunch of vectors and at once took their outer product and got a high order tensor. In hierarchical Tucker, this process is done incrementally. I take vectors, construct matrices. Take these matrices, construct order four tensors. Take these order four tensors, order eight, and so forth. So there's implicitly an underlying tree structure going on between di uh, over dimensions. Okay? That's hierarchical Tucker. Okay? So every level here, that's a step of the process that I just described, and it has its own parameters. And if I plug this in to the coefficient tensor, I indeed get a deep network. Exactly like the one before, except that we don't have one hidden layer with global pooling. We have a number of hidden layers. Every hidden layer corresponds to a step in the decomposition. The number of factors in a step is exactly the width of the hidden layer. Okay? Um, the fact that in this case I combine two tensors at a time, that means that the pooling windows will cover two entries at a time. Before there was global pooling corresponding to the fact that I took an outer product between all the vectors. Okay? Uh, the weights of, the hidden, of a hidden layer correspond to the parameters of the corresponding of the step, the matching step. And again, these two things are the same. Okay? So classic CP decomposition, shallow convnet, modern hierarchical Tucker decomposition, deep convnet. Okay? And we have here. Composition, decomposition in each layer? Yeah, okay, so I described a process where I take vectors, construct matrices, take matrices, construct order four tensors, and so forth. 
It's actually a little more complicated. At every, at every step of the process, I hold groups of vectors, then take two groups of vectors and get a group of matrices. Two groups of matrices get a group of order four tensors. The number of elements in a group, that's exactly this number of terms here, and that's the width of the hidden layer. Okay, the, the details are not that kind of critical at but this I'm moment. I was trying to draw a line between the pictures you had, I don't know, like six slides ago, where you were actually starting with a picture of a woman, and then you had these. Okay, so this is the woman now? Yeah, right. And, or man, I don't want to be, I'm recorded, so. Um, okay, yes. And then the uh, width, width in this direction. That was the number of sheets, if yeah, you will. Right. It was called sheets. That's here. I'm not drawing it this way. Like Just a three-dimensional book. Number of vectors in the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's what matters, I guess, at this point. Okay. Um, take all the details, little details offline. Okay. So we have ourselves an equivalence between hierarchical tensor decompositions and convolutional arithmetic circuits. Cynics would say that these are not the kind of continents that are most commonly used. So they actually do work well in practice, but they are not the most popular type of continents. Actually, I'm not going to talk about this a lot, but this equivalence could be adapted to other types of continents as well. Okay? Hierarchical tensor decompositions are based on outer products. What's an outer product? I have two arrays. Their outer product is formed by multiplication of an entry from here and an entry from there. If I replace this multiplication with a maximum, my network my corresponding network would not have product pooling, it would have max pooling. I can do similar things and include ReLU. And actually, this equivalence holds for many more types of continents. It's more difficult to analyze the decompositions, but the equivalence holds. Okay, and I'll talk about a result that we showed for ReLU and max pooling and stuff like that. Um, what we're going to do now is use this equivalence to derive results on the expressiveness of convolutional networks. Okay, we're going to see what this equivalence is useful for, or at least one application. So we are interested now in approximation error, expressiveness of convolutional networks, the main deep learning architecture. Right. We're going to start with a very fundamental question, which is why depth? Why does deep learning need to be deep? There's a long-standing conjecture. It's called efficiency of depth, and that is that deep networks can realize functions efficiently with a modest computational price. And if you try to replicate or approximate these functions with shallow networks, these shallow networks would have to be very, very large. Okay? The reason people believe this, obviously, is that every year networks become deeper, performance increases. So we all think that de depth is a wonderful thing. Okay, Adopting the tensor decomposition viewpoint we get a statement, a proposition, that relates to tensors. Okay? This is a shallow continent. The width of the hidden layer is R0. That's the number of terms in the corresponding CP decomposition. This is a deep continent, and that corresponds to HD decomposition. Efficiency of depth here states, it, it means that HD decomposition, hierarchical Tucker, realizes tensors that require CP decomposition to have many, many terms. Okay, so the R0 would have to be very, very large for CP decomposition to replicate or approximate tensors generated by HD decomposition. <coughs> so instead of thinking of functions, we think of tensors. Instead of thinking of networks, we have tensor decompositions. Okay? And we go ahead and prove this. This is something that was not known. We show that HD decomposition generates tensors that have an exponential CP rank. Okay, CP decomposition to match these networks, the number of terms would have to be exponential in n, the number of input elements. Okay? Moreover, not only does HD decomposition realize such tensors for certain parameter settings, this is actually the generic case. It happens almost always. If I look at these parameter space, uh, parameters as a measure space, the set of parameter configurations that would give me a tensor efficiently realizable by CP has measure zero. Then this is something that was not known. Yeah? What do you take L to be for this, these statements, big L? L? So in this specific case, every time, every step of the decomposition, the order of the tensors doubles. So L is log 2 
of the number of pixels. But this is just an example because it has a specific name. The result, I'll, I'll say a word about generalizing, but these are just canonical examples. The result's much more general. Okay? Bottom line, a hierarchical decomposition with probable in the generic case, generates tensors that have an exponential sequence. You're these tensors that you produce are long if you try to express them in directly in the old yeah. coordinates. So you know your tensors are kind of equidistributed in this space? Are they all over the shell? Are they all over? Uh, well, we so they're, they're, they're the, the ones that are not have measure zero, so they are all uh, over the place. What major are you? In yeah. the space of tensors, you have some. It's not in the space of tensors, it's in the space of parameters. Okay. Okay. You, you things in terms of those. And, and the reason is because that is what matters from a machine learning perspective. That's what you optimize over. That's, these are the, um, when you learn a tensor or a network, you learn parameter settings. Okay. When you optimize, you move in parameter space. Okay. So um, there is a question of how does this closed zero measure set look like? We know that it's closed, that set. So it's not something pathological. Okay? But is the reverse implication false? Great question. So, yes. It's, if CP decomposition realizes some tensor, and I want to replicate that with HD, all I have to do is set the ranks here, the number of terms, to be the same as in CP case, and I would get the same tensor with some computational price, but the price is linear. On the other direction, the price would be exponential. That's the efficiency part. Okay. Okay. Returning to a network perspective, what this means is that if we randomize the weights of the deep network by a continuous distribution, with probability one, we get a function that requires the shallow network to be exponentially large. Okay, and we reach this result through the tensor viewpoint. So what uh, you must have to have you have to have specific conditions on your on your distribution. Don't you? It can't it can't be just for so it's a, con it's a continuous, because the measure is zero, under a continuous distribution, you will land there. So you're saying any continuous distribution? Yeah. You don't have any? Any continuous. Any, continuous. It needs to be continuous. That's okay, an assumption. Well, that's but yeah. Yeah. And usually when people initialize for optimization, just initialize Gaussian distribution. So, so it's actually the case. Yeah. So is it correct to say that this theorem uh, is divorced from any consideration of what type of this unknown distribution D, I guess you called it, uh, between, on the product X cross Y. Okay, so let's not confuse. D here, that's a distribution of data. I am now talking about hypothesis spaces and finding a hypothesis within that space. I am saying that inside your hypothesis space of a deep network, almost any hypothesis <coughs> lies outside the hypothesis space of a shallow network. That's what I'm saying. Um, I'm not saying that these are good for specific data distributions. I'm not claiming that right now. In a few minutes, I will start reaching these kind of arguments. OK? All right. So I'll obviously skip the pr idea of the proof. Um, we generalize this in various ways. One way is not just HD versus CP, but we compare various depths. We show there that the, number, the computational price you pay when you cut off layers is double exponential and the number of layers you cut off. What we saw before was a special case. And we also apply this kind of result to the case of ReLU and max pooling with the generalized tensor decompositions. There we prove a weaker result. There exist tensors generated by a deep network that can't be realized by a shallow one, but that's not always, almost always the case. And it's not that we don't prove that it's not almost always the case. We actually prove that it is not almost always the case. Okay, so we show that the set of functions realizable by a deep network with max pooling and ReLU that can also be realized by a shallow is non-negligible. So they are weaker in some sense, the kind of models that most people use. Okay? Bottom line, we've established the efficiency of depth for convolutional networks, at least for the models that are covered here. Okay, now we'll start... Um, reasoning about some of the, one of the questions that was asked here, and that is, okay, so deep networks can do more than shallow. Who says that what they're doing is interesting? Okay, why should that mean anything? Um, so we're going to look at a particular aspect and show results on that. Okay, so ConvNets realize functions over many pixels, and an important property of such functions is their ability to model interactions 
between different sets of pixels. Okay? We want our functions to be able to model correlations between pixels, whatever correlations means. Okay? It's not a statistical setting. We're just talking qualitatively. Okay? So intuitively, if we have an image, the pixels in the blue locations and the yellow locations here are probably correlated pretty strongly with one another. So we want to be able to model that. And here, in this case, maybe a little less. Okay? Left image, left part of the image, and the right one. That might be a little less important to model correlations there. So first of all, we ask, what does it mean modeling correlations? And we want to define some quantitative measure, and we'll do that. And also, what kind of interactions, I'll call it interactions here, what kind of interactions can convolutional networks model? And how does that depend on the architecture of the network? Okay? We will turn here to the world of quantum entanglement. Okay? I will present this in a very kind of redu reductionist um, way. Okay? So we have n quantum particles. Okay? In, in quantum physics, some of the people here know about this much more than I do, a state of a particle is represented as a vector in a Hilbert space. Okay? In many cases, finite dimensional, even two dimensional. So we have a finite dimensional basis and states of particles are represented as linear combinations of those. Okay. A state of n particles, that is represented as a vector in the tensor product space. Okay. A state of n particles, that's a linear combination over these tensor product bases. Okay. Tensor product of h, the Hilbert space with itself, n times. And we have, again, a coefficient tensor like we had before. And quantum entanglement measures these are measures that quantify interactions or, um, that a system state models between sets of particles. Okay? And it's something very deep, has a lot of implications, and physicists care a lot about this. And we are going to make use of this concept for our purposes. Okay, so this is a system state. Think now about a partition of the n particles to two sets, okay? the brown set and its complement, the blue. Okay. Given this partition, we can define a matricization of the coefficient tensor with respect to this partition. What does that mean? The coefficient tensor has n indices, has n modes, and we are given a partition of these indices. The matricization, the respective matricization, is just an arrangement of the tensor as a matrix, where the rows are the dimensions that correspond to one set, and the columns are the dimensions that correspond to another. Yeah? This is just rearranging your dimensions and flattening out as a matrix, which will be huge, obviously. Okay? So this is the state of a quantum many-body system. And this is a matricization corresponding to some partition. Let sigma this be the vector of singular values of the matricization. Quantum entanglement measures are defined in terms of these singular values. Okay? The quantum entanglement between the particles of I and its complement are defined in terms of the singular values of the matricization. Okay? So the most kind of famous, um, widely used measure is called entanglement entropy. Okay? And this is just take your singular values, square them, normalize entropy of that. That's the entanglement entropy between these particles and these ones. Other measures are geometric measure. Okay? That's the energy, if you will, of the second to last singular values, all, of, all singular values besides the first. And a third measure, which people often use, is called the Schmidt number. That's just the number of non-zero singular values. Okay, so I assume a lot of people here have seen this and might be a little bit surprised to see how I'm presenting it, but um, this is what we need. Okay, So that's the Schmidt number. How is this relevant to us in any way? It's relevant because you can see here that there is a structural equivalence between a quantum many-body state, a state over many particles, and a function realized by a convolutional arithmetic circuit, okay, a function over many pixels. So here we have a linear combination over these tensor product bases, and here we have a linear combination over these product functions, and in both cases we have a coefficient tensor. Somehow when it gets quantum, a cat always comes in. Yeah. So here he is. Yeah. <laughs> He's both here and not here. <laughs> and so what we're going to do is just take these measures of entanglement and apply them to a coefficient tensor of a continent, and we will get entanglement measures 
that quantify interactions between pixels that a function models. Okay? So this is one way to present it. I could take these quantum entanglement measures, forget about quantum mechanics, and just give a very straightforward interpretation. I think this story is nicer, so this is how it goes. I mean, do you use any inequalities from entanglement? I'm going to use compu tools and results. I'm going to use a result from quantum mechanics, yeah. Okay. Now I've, for now, I've just imported the definition. Yeah. OK, so great question. Um, we are going to use some more tools from quantum mechanics and It's, yeah, one, between a product state and a, yeah, and a state. it's not just a structural equivalence that they look the same. These two things can actually be thought of as exactly the same thing. Okay. But the, but the lower is sort of scalar, so it's, it's not the same state. I, mean, no. I could think of an inner product. Okay, let's put it this way. If I take this and have an inner product with a product state, I get exactly yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're going to use tensor networks. These are not the tensor decompositions I talked about before. They're something else. They're closely related, but for now, think of them as something else. These are graphs where vertices, nodes, correspond to tensors, and the, num the edges correspond to modes, to dimensions. Okay, so in tensor network, um, in tensor network uh, diagram, this would be a scalar. That's a node without any edges. This would be a vector. This is a matrix, and this is an order three tensor. And if I take two nodes and connect them, an edge that connects two vertices, that represents contraction. So these are two vectors attached to one another. That's an inner product between vectors. This is matrix multiplication. Okay? And typically in a graph, so every edge here connects between two modes of a tensor, and these modes have a dimension. And so you can think of the edge as carrying a weight. That weight is the dimension. Okay, that's being contracted over. So if this is a 10-dimensional vector and a product with a 10-dimensional vector, the edge here would be weighted by 10. Okay, think about it that way. All right, so how is this relevant to us? It's relevant because we show that a coefficient tensor of a convolutional arithmetic circuit can be represented as a specific tensor network. Okay, this is a tree tensor network, for those that know. And the, there are a set of open nodes in this tree tensor network. They correspond to the input pixels. And there are weights on the edges. These correspond to the widths of hidden layers in the network. And the geometry of the tree, which inputs are connect in which level, that corresponds to the geometry of the pooling windows in the network. Okay? And we're going to use this to quantify entanglement that a network models between pixels. And there are different results in quantum mechanics. Here we proved a specific variant for the specific networks we care about. And that ties quantum entanglement measures to minimal cuts in a tensor network. Okay? What we show is that the maximal Schmidt entanglement that a convex C models between two sets of pixels is equal to the minimal cut in the respective tensor network that separates the corresponding sets of nodes. What the heck does that mean? We have a function over pixels. We divide these pixels into two groups conceptually, and we ask, what is the entanglement modeled between these two sets of pixels? The answer, go to the respective tensor network, find the input nodes that correspond to the two sets, take the minimal cut separating them, that's your entanglement. Okay. So now we have a way to quantify the entanglement that are convolutional network models between two sets of pixels. Okay? And we want to control this entanglement. That means controlling minimal cuts in the respective tensor network. And you can control minimal cuts in this tensor network in two ways. One, you can play with these green values, which are the widths of hidden layers. You can change the widths of hidden layers to affect minimal cuts. And you can change the pooling geometry to play with the geometry of the tree. That will also affect the minimal cuts. Okay, so we have here a way to analyze the effect of a network architecture on the kind of interactions it can model between pixels. Okay, and we treat these two factors specifically. We show that the width in deep layers is important for modeling interaction, entanglement, between pixels that are far apart. 
And the width of early layers is important for short range. So if you are classifying, if your network is classifying large objects, okay, and it's important for, for it to model entanglement between pixels that are far apart, you better have your deep layers wider. And vice versa, if you're classifying small objects, it's important to have your early layers wider. Okay, so we get a rule of thumb here that tells us something about how we should design an architecture according to what we know on a task at hand. Again, we run experiments that demonstrate this, and I'll skip the details. Okay? In terms of pooling, what we show is that elements that are pooled together earlier can have stronger entanglement. So if you are interested in modeling strong entanglement between pixels that are nearby, that seems reasonable, then you better pool together adjacent elements. And that's exactly what people do. Okay, so this kind of retroactively explains the custom of pooling together adjacent elements. Implicitly, it biases you towards modeling interaction between nearby pixels. But you can also do other things. For example, if you have these kind of synthetic medical-like images and you want to be able to detect symmetry of objects, then you might want to pool together pixels from opposite sides of the image. And we also show this empirically and demonstrate that uh, you can indeed benefit here. Okay, so in both cases, both layer widths and pooling geometry, we have um, the theory gives us a rule of thumb on how we should design these networks according to something we know. Okay, right now, the process of designing convolutional networks is completely ad hoc. And there's a lot to do in that sense. This is kind of a baby step on that direction. Okay? I will skip this part because it's almost cookie time. Okay? So I'll skip the part of um, interconnectivity. What we show here is that if you take two networks and you start introducing connections between their hidden layers, which is the kind of things that people do in modern deep learning, you get an efficiency in terms of your representational ability. You can represent things that if you try to represent with individual networks, you wouldn't be able to. Okay? But I'm going to skip that. All right, and reach optimization. Okay, so we have seven minutes until everyone runs outside and uh, grabs their cookies, and we'll spend that this time uh, talking about a new work on optimization. Okay, so now we're no longer treating approximation error; we are treating the training error. Okay, the fact that we are optimizing non-convex functions and we somehow are able to find this H star S. Right? The conventional wisdom in terms of the role of depth is the following. Depth, everyone believes that depth helps expressiveness. We prove this for these kind of models. It has been proven for other types of models as well. What people also believe is that it makes optimization more difficult because your problems are no longer convex. Okay? And so it's unclear why we are able to solve these things, because non-convex optimization problems are, in worst case, difficult. What people also believe, and this has been shown in certain settings, is the following. People believe that pretty much, qualitatively speaking, every local minima in your objective is as good as global. And that means that gradient-based Optimization methods will converge to a global optimum. For, uh, that's really a feature of, of your, somehow, what you're trying. No, but that's certainly not a universal statement. Okay, so what? <laughs> you, you mean it depends on the data? or No, it's not a universal. Uh, you're just uh, doing optimization. No, it's not a new, No, people don't believe this for non-convex optimization in general, but they believe that this is the case for the kind of con non-convex problems we they get with deep networks. It you, because of, there are some natural correlations that you see. Okay, so, in, in nature, right? so, so, that's a, so there are two things that affect the optimization problem. The architecture of the network, the structure of the hypothesis space, and the data. Okay? So people believe that for the structure of the hypothesis space, you get things like this. How it depends on the data, there isn't really uh, an understanding of this. In some cases, they can show that it holds unconditionally, irrespective of the data. Other analyses assume something about the data usually something unrealistic like Gaussian distributions and things like that. But that's kind of, this is a hand wavy conventional wisdom slide. Okay? That's what people believe right now. And there's a question here? So uh, what is what they believe? That the typical critical point is not far in its 
value up for the function from the optimal. Indeed. Global Indeed. They had many minimizers, therefore. Yep. So it's min, but yeah. OK. Um, what we are going to see is a very different result, Okay, qualitatively different. And we're going to focus on linear networks. I'll explain what that is. Okay, so this is a recent work that was done here. Uh, OK, so what is a linear network? Forget now about convolutional networks. We're treating something much, much simpler. This is a function that maps an input vector x through some linear transformation. This linear transformation is over-parameterized. It is represented as a sequence of matrix multiplications. Okay, that is called a linear network. People use this to, as a kind of surrogate toy model to study optimization. Because it's linear in its input-output mapping, it is nonlinear in its parametrization, obviously. And the optimization problems are non-convex. Okay? Um, so notice that with this model, going deeper does not change the expressiveness. Okay? So if we want to study the effect of depth on optimization, there's actually an advantage to this model. And that is that expressiveness is somehow decoupled. Otherwise, by adding layers, we change the expressiveness. And so we change the optimization problem. And it's unclear if the difference we are seeing is a result of some change in expressiveness or something fundamental to the optimization. Okay, so as a first step. Uh, no, I am given, my labels here are the result of this linear transformation. I'm, gi I'm given vectors x and y. Yeah, but the, the new, the guys you're producing, you're producing by applying these w's. Yes. And where do they, are, they, are you yeah. I'm going to learn them. That's, the, that's what's optimized. Okay. All right, so trivial definition, end-to-end -end matrix. That's just the sequence of matrices of our parameters multiplied by one another. Okay, And given some loss over a linear model, okay, we immediately have an over-parameterized loss. This is a loss over the n matrices. And it's obtained in a very simple way. Just multiply them with one another, get the end-to-end -end matrix, plug that in. Okay? The question we ask is the following. If I apply gradient descent to optimize this thing, this over-parameterized loss, how does my underlying model the end-to-end -end matrix, how does that move in space? It's no longer going to move through gr at, per gradient descent. It's going to move in a different way. And that's the question that we're interested in. And what we're showing, qual I guess this is uh, sweeping away a few of the details, but the general result is as follows. If I optimize these matrices through gradient descent, the end-to-end -end matrix follows a certain update rule that we have a closed form description for. It doesn't matter. You don't have to parse all the details here. What matters is that we have a concrete update rule for the end-to-end -end matrix. This is what happens under the hood when you apply gradient descent to, these, to this uh, object. Okay? What we show, kind of take a series of steps to interpret this thing, we show that this is a preconditioning scheme. Okay? What is preconditioning? When I apply gradient descent, a preconditioning scheme means to apply gradient descent. And at every step, instead of using the gradient as is, I somehow um, apply some transformation to it, usually multiplication by a PSD matrix, which means stretching it by a non-negative amount in different directions. There are different kind of PSD matrices people use. For example, Newton, if you heard of it, is a particular kind of PSD matrix that depends on second derivatives. <coughs> Preconditioning is something very um, widely used. What we show is that this is a specific preconditioning scheme, and it somehow promotes movement along directions that the optimizer has already taken. Okay, this can be interpreted as some combination of adaptive learning rate and momentum. For those that know what it is, it's fine, it's good. For those that don't, they kind of, you have here, see here the kind of effects that resemble types of optimization methods that people use. Okay. The bottom line here is that with linear networks, adding depth induces on gradient descent a certain acceleration scheme. By acceleration here, I don't mean that optimization will be necessarily faster. I'm just saying that it's a t that's what people call acceleration methods. Okay? And so what, what does it mean? What is I mean? How is it better? So for now, I'm not saying it's better. That's the next slide. Okay. 
For now, I'm just saying that it's a type of acceleration method that resembles acceleration methods that people use. The term acceleration method, typically an acceleration method sometimes accelerates and sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of a modification of gradient descent. Okay? So that's kind of an optimization jargon here. And we actually do show that this can accelerate or speed up, but it depends on the kind of objective. Okay? And specifically, for the case, for example, if your input is an image and you want to predict a continuous value and your loss is LP with P greater than 2, for example, L4, it leads to a very, very significant speed up. Okay, so think about this, what hap what's happening here. We have a convex problem, a linear model. We introduce depth. We don't gain anything in terms of expressiveness, and yet optimization accelerates significantly, okay? even though this is non-convex. And then we went ahead and compared this implicit acceleration, implicit speed up, to explicit acceleration methods that people designed for convex problems. We see that in this case, the implicit speed up is actually much more significant. Okay, so the takeaway here is that depth does not necessarily complicate optimization, even though it introduces non-convexity. There are different types of non-convexity. Some are bad and some are not. Okay, non-convexity is like non-elephant animals. Okay, some of them are very small and some of them are very big. And I think there's no way around analyzing the particular models and the particular functions that uh, we're interested in. Because otherwise, we just resort to worst case and we know that hell breaks loose. Well, maybe you could cut that out when you edit. Uh. Okay, so let's now uh, conclude. Go eat cookies. By the way, do you guys eat cookies? Matzah. A, matzah? Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> and I was supposed to be a Cohen. <laughs> uh, sorry. Maybe kosher or cookies. Okay, so statistical learning theory, there are three pillars, expressiveness, generalization, and optimization. Um, I think most would agree that in classical machine learning, we had pretty much a well-developed understanding of these factors, and in deep learning, we don't. Okay? Um, we derived an equivalence between convolutional networks and hierarchical tensor decompositions. We use this to analyze the expressiveness of convnets, talked about efficiency of depth, um, modeling interactions, entanglement, and also interconnectivity, which I skipped over. And as a first step in analyzing uh, optimization, we treated linear networks and showed that depth can actually make optimization easier, can actually improve optimization. Okay? What I'm thinking about now is to take the optimization analysis step further and apply that to the convnets using the equivalence to tensor decompositions. Okay? That's what I'm working on uh, right now. Right. And I guess with this, um, I'll conclude. <laughs> Thank you very much.